Good morning. Good morning, everybody. This is my uh, my name is Dr. Michelle Hurst Bandima, Commissioner Bandima. I want to get started early because we have a lot on the agenda. In addition to that, one of our um, commissioners who's actually on the policy committee, um, he will not be here. However, he read the uh, agenda and he sent a list of questions that um, he wanted answered or asked or at some point addressed. And what I have done is um, I'm going to send you the questions as well. But in addition to that, I'm going to start off some of it by telling you what he's asking because it's so long. And in between, as you're presenting, you can um, address some of it. However, I'll give you the list of questions or I'll send it to you by email and you can send it to him. But in the interest of transparency, so the public can know what we're talking about, I'm going to read some of the questions and throughout, uh, because one of the questions deals with from 1 to 11. Which body, they're all procurement if you want to wait to that section. They're all procurement. Oh, yeah. They're all procurement. Oh, but I'm, I'm talking to our CEO. Uh, okay. Our, our CEO, uh, COO. COO. <laughs> So I'll make sure that, because I was looking directly at you. Thank you so much. So I'll uh, give those. But the first one does address from 1 to 11. The first question in number, see at the bottom? It says 1 to 11. It, it addresses the concerns from 1 to 11. Yeah, procurement items okay, 1 to so 11, yes. So I'll do yes. that at the end. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. So let's get started. We're going to start on time and move through the process, and um, and thank you very much for being here this morning. The operation committee will open right now, and the time right now, let's see what is the time. It's 10.01. So we're going to look at capital improvement pro program. CIP, could you introduce yourself and get started? Thank you so much for being here. Good morning. I'm Nicole Stewart, the Director of Facilities Planning and Real Estate. And I'm Cindy Smith. I'm the Director of Facilities Design and Construction. This morning, we will be presenting the mid-year report for the Capital Improvement Program for this year. As you all are aware, our CIP is our six-year plan for identifying uh, construction needs across the city uh, and making requests uh, to the state and the city for uh, funds for those capital projects we identified. So today we'll just go through what our goals have been for the CIP, the FY 2020 CIP, what the requests are, uh, what some of the financial implications uh, have, are for the CIP, what the IEC 75% staff recommendation is. Uh, we'll also give a brief update on previous CIP, out, CIP awards and other sources of funding including the HVAC funds from, that were allocated last year. Uh, and then we'll just uh, walk through the remaining timeline for the CIP for this year. Okay, real quick, 75% of the staff recommendation that you met, that you sent out uh, something for staff to fill out and only 75% no, so the 75% staff recommendation represents the IAC, the Interagency Commission on Public School Construction. So they get the um, governor's budget, and then by this point, they will have allocated 75% of the governor's budget. Okay, thank you. So the key goals for FY 2020, some of this you um, have seen before, but it, uh, it's worth uh, repeating for the public. Uh, so for this year, we focused on um, requesting the balance of funds for our major projects, Hollabird and Graceland. Uh, that was in the amount of uh, $13 million was the balance on those two major projects. We also submitted uh, both planning and uh, for local, um, or for planning and funding from Marigi Faring, which you'll hear more about. Uh, we also submitted uh, projects for year three of the five-year air conditioning plan. Um, we also uh, submitted in the interest of um, the remaining consistent across CIP years, any unfunded projects from last year that were uh, not funded by the state. And then we also looked at a couple of new projects, uh, including roofs that were beyond their life cycle. Uh, so in terms of requests, this table just outlines the different projects by project type. Uh, the total is 37 projects, and as I mentioned earlier, we um, 
requested funds for the major projects and then, of course, our systemic projects, including AC, HVAC, fire safety, and, other kind, and roofs and other kinds of projects. So this is just a map of uh, our CIP requests against the Community Conditions Index. Uh, this is an index uh, we developed just to um, sort of categorize the neighborhoods across Baltimore City, and we've been using it to uh, really look at the distribution of um, our investments and assets uh, across the district. And so this is just a map showing where the schools are located for which we requested CIP funds for this year. So the total uh, CIP request was $104 million, $85 million from the state. Our uh, city, I'm sorry, our local allocation is $19 million from the city. Of course, this doesn't represent the full scope of our needs. Uh, we have about a $3 billion uh, backlog in um, capital funding, which includes about a billion dollars in, in HVAC work needed. So. Even though you know, we make this request every year, it doesn't um, reflect the totality of all the district's needs. Right, so this is just a quick summary table of the things that have been funded, projects that have been funded so far for the 75% allocation. As I mentioned before, uh, the governor's budget is $280 million, uh, so they've allocated about uh, $210 million. What also this year, what the IEC did, they also projected what our full allocation will be for FY 2020. So in that first uh, column um, includes the request, the FY 2020 request. The second column with the amounts indicates how much they've actually uh, allocated with that 75% um, um, recommendation from the IEC, which was $22.7 million. And then they're projecting out once they get to 100% in May that we'll uh, receive about $29 million in capital funding. Uh, in terms of the projects that were funded, just real briefly, you can see that the uh, majority of our projects are um, our AC projects to fulfill our air conditioning plan. So actually, if we look at it by sort of a, a rolled up summary by project category, we can see that of that $29 million, um, about half of it is going to fund our uh, major projects. Uh, about 30% of it is going to those AC projects and about 22%, uh, which is 6 million going to any other systemic project. And so the point there is that uh, with our limited allocation that we receive from the state, obviously uh, the kinds of projects that we can get done in one, um, uh, with one allocation is limited. So just to go over some of our past projects and the status, um, we are in the midst of the construction for Halliburton Graceland. Um, the schedule of the projects has them uh, ready to occupy in the summer of 2020. Um, so we're... Uh, above ground at this point and steadily proceeding despite some weather delays that we've had this fall. In regards to our previous CIPs and the status, um, in FY 2019 we had 22 projects and 21 of them are in design and actually the other one is out for um, design procurement at this moment. Um, for the FY 18, uh, they're all in various stages. Uh, the thing to note here is between 17 and 18, we had a large number of projects that were from FY17 that were rescinded because they were partially funded, and those impacted the FY18 as well because they were FY17 and 18 projects. So they are counted in both categories. In regards to our air conditioning plan, we are starting on that third year. Um, we have currently um, three schools in construction, which is actually four projects. Um, I have, there's another one starting construction and another one that was just approved last week for the contract. So they are going. Um, there's several more out for bid right now. Uh, and a variety of the FY19s are all in construction, or in design, I'm sorry, in design. So they are uh, proceeding as they had currently planned. Oh, I have a question. Thank you for the information. The one thing that I always ask and this is really for us, you're doing a great job, but when we're in the public and we're with the legislatures and council people, and they ask us, we repeat what you're saying, and 
we internalize all of that. However, they always ask for specific <coughs> schools. And when you say uh, two of which were 21 century projects, 21st century projects, if it would be nice, and I've said this, to give us as much information, and you don't even have to read it all the time, but when we are reviewing it before we get here, it's good for us to know that this is the school that they're doing this work with. And, right. and what we do is we copy it, and sometimes we actually carry it around because the, the legislatures or the council people want to know what's going on in their district. And, we, and sometimes I'll go, wait a minute, and it looks like I don't know what's going on, but I do know what's going on. So more information is better than, uh, you know, a little bit in information. So could you please just add that to it? And as a matter of fact, with this one, could you do it and send it to us? Because these are the big questions that they're asking. I okay. will note, that, too, that it is on our website. We uh -huh. do have our AC plan completely outlined on now, the website, I, I don't too. Even, I, and I got it. Yep. Of research. I, I, I don't, mm -hmm. you know what, we, information mm -hmm. comes so fast, so yep. swift, that when I walk out here, somebody could be meeting me on the parking lot. So mm -hmm. which school did they say? I just need to say, oh, yeah, this is the school. So you're doing a great job. I just need to know more information, and that's all okay. for all of us. Thanks here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So. But you always ask for that, and they never do. You always ask for that. I did that there last time. Okay, moving on from the AC plan then? Let me just say oh, this. Yes. I asked mm -hmm. for this before. I think I asked this same question every time. So I've asked before to add more information. Okay. Okay, okay thanks a lot. And we can, we can just include it on the, the next presentation yeah. as an appendix. We can include it in the next presentation in the, in the appendix in the back. Yeah, no, this right here, we need. Mm -hmm. to She's it. saying she'll put it in the yeah. appendix. For, for okay. the next, right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we can when we send the update to it. That'll be great. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Okay, so um, in addition, we received um, an additional $15 million for HVAC projects. Uh, last year it was allocated to us, and I apologize, there's apparently uh, an error. That should be a dollar sign, not an E okay. on, <laughs> on this. I don't know what happened there. but um, So these were uh, not for CIP projects, but these were for projects that needed more immediate um, issues and not for full HVAC projects necessarily, but for things like boilers or chillers or piping where we're having trouble. Um, so they, the funds were, were for design or construction. Um, for any HVAC projects uh, that needed more immediate work. We've identified 34 projects um, and two million has been allocated and approved by the IAC already for the three projects listed here, Margaret Brent, Tench Tolman, and Harlem Park. Uh, the requests for the remainder have actually been submitted already as of uh, Friday um, for consideration and uh, they all will be encumbered within two years of that allocation. So this is just a summary of the remaining decision points and timelines. Uh, and so you can see right now uh, between December and January uh, reflects this 75% uh, of the government's budget is um, reported on this day. Um, the 90% actually, I need to check on whether or not, actually I need to check on, uh, I'm sorry, let me repeat myself, my mic was off. Um, so this is just represents the decision points and timeline, the remaining timeline for the CIP for this year. So the important dates are um, that it, by May and between May and June, we'll receive the full allocation from the state. So just in conclusion, um, in December, mid-December, we appealed all of the FY 2020 projects that were not recommended for funding. That's the normal process. Uh, we go through that every year. Um, the t and the, the ones that received only partial funding. We wanted to note that there are a couple important things um, out of that appeal. Uh, number one, uh, Armistead Gardens, which was also included in the uh, request uh, for FY 2020, did not receive any funding um, or any recommendation for funding for this year. In addition, um, we have been informed that the uh, IAC is not in support or the executive director is not in support of including the fire sprinklers in the scopes for the fire safety projects. So the sprinkler portion of the fire safety projects have been excluded from the funding of that has been approved for those projects. So that they would be alarms only. They'll be what? Fire alarms. So just the alarm system only and not the sprinkler. 
Is that up to code? I mean, can we do that? So um, it is, there is no requirement for sprinklers. Okay. We put sprinklers in our facilities because um, to support our fire departments. If our fire, our fire department, they fight fires within the buildings. Mm -hmm. There are some who only do the exterior. So we put sprinklers in the buildings to preserve <coughs> our assets and also for the fact that there are people who are going to go into a building to respond. We've communicated this to the IAC. Um, public school construction staff um, and the executive director has determined that he is not going to fund the fire sprinklers. Is there another bucket we could get that from? Um, we could use local dollars, but I don't think we have enough local dollars to support yeah. that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I have um, a question and a comment. I came in on slide, uh, what is it? Seven. And so I apologize, you covered this, but what does the $85 million represent? So the $85 million represents the actual request for the 37 projects. So, so why, why would we ask for 87 when we expect to receive 29? Well, one thing is we we don't know how much we're, money we're going to receive every year. That's one piece of it. And we are trying to remain consistent across CIPs and also to demonstrate our, our needs. So, for instance, if we only submitted you know, the four or five systemic projects that would get funded, uh, there is some reasonable concern that, um, one, it might appear that we don't understand sort of what our emergent needs are. And we're actually making a request for, you know, our most emergent needs. But why is it not 45 or 110? Where do you so get 85? It, and the, I guess the other layer is it that if there was a project that was submitted during our previous RCIP that was funded, and let's say that um, when we got into the project, the scope of the project expanded, and it, so it cost more than what was estimated, and we had to rescind the project, we can then go to another project that ha that's on that list that has not been funded and get that project funded. But okay. And the other um, is, yes, our need is a lot larger. Um, it's higher than the $85 million. Right. Um, we have had a, a discussion with the IAC because every project that we submit has to go through a review process for their teams, and we have to pay, prepare the backups. So I, that $85 million is probably the point by which the IAC is not interested in reviewing any other additional applications, understanding that they know that the, it's not going to be funded. Do we submit a priority within the 85? Yes. yes. So the priority is probably closer to the actual amount we receive, or at least they take so it we, against the priorities? So How we prioritize every project mm -hmm. as a part of this. So we go through a process by which we uh, sit down with our FMNO team, design, mm -hmm. construction, and planning, and then we prioritize um, those projects. Uh, and so we identify. So as an example, this year, the projects that we added um, to the list, even though we knew we weren't going to probably get that far down the list uh, mm -hmm. was the roof projects because we have uh, about seven roof projects here that represent roofs that are just beyond uh, their life cycle. Uh, and so we included them because they are important uh, mm -hmm. uh, projects for us. And also, we also don't know whether or not there will be additional funding <laughs> in one year. So as an example, last year there was an, um, funding for immediate threat projects, and so we were able to fund more projects uh, right. with the additional $12 million that was allocated to city schools, and so they were able to go to the list of prioritized projects uh, that had already been reviewed by the IC, I and see. we were able to get those So funding. the 85, they will review all 85, or they So the $85 million represents, right, the 37 um, okay. uh, projects. Thanks. And the other, um, the comment is, and I've raised this before, is the degree to which the, the school district has conversations with, say, the housing authority or the city's mm -hmm. um, planning department or housing department about priorities that might be better aligned with mm -hmm. goals of the city to redevelop particular neighborhoods or to sort of advance a particular project? And are we looking for, I'm not suggesting that every project we do should be subject to someone else's priorities. But on the other hand, there are probably examples of priorities, 
city projects that could be ours because c the combined projects would have a sort of greater impact than just sort of doing this without having those conversations? Sure. So I'm glad you asked that question. Yep, I knew you so would So we've been actually uh, having those conversations and doing that work. We just met last week with um, Bob Pippick from housing in addition Great. to some of the staff um, from planning. And right now we are um, developing scope for what that relationship uh, could look like uh, for both our 21st century projects and projects potentially impacted by um, portfolio uh, actions. And Fantastic. So and then... Uh, would you consider adding the housing authority to that as well? So, uh, sure. Yeah, so... Um, he's with right. planning. I mean, no. he's with the housing department. Yes, as opposed that's true. To, they're separate now. Yes. But you just asked her to add housing. Housing, uh, housing they, authority. They, they not the, split. The housing right. authority, which is public housing, and they're doing a lot of redevelopment. Yes. Like in Old Town. So, so I would just ask that you yes. consider adding the housing authority because they're doing major yes. modernization and renovations and major new projects, and there could be a school component of them. Right. So we we uh, also have been uh, attending uh, my office and O and I the mayor <laughs> sub cabinet. So that Good. is uh, the meeting where all the different right. agencies come together to focus on a specific uh, neighborhood okay. in Baltimore City. And so we're just uh, looking through what our options are for what that school and housing intersection is. I do want to add though that you know our. Uh, interests aren't necessarily always aligned. No, not always. But in okay. some cases they could be. But yes. thank you. That's a great answer. <laughs> Can yes. I just add to that? Can we keep getting updates on that work? Yes. In this yes. meeting? Yes. Thank you. I mean, that could be On green, but sure. And uh, so we, so I just also will caveat that we're still having those discussions for what that uh, looks like. Uh, and so, you know, we're open to suggestions, but we can definitely um, make updates as needed. Yeah. You have several folks on the board with great experience in that kind of work. So yes. if you ever need just to pick our brains, you can do that. But I'm very interested yes. in this idea of alignment with yes. the rest of the city. So thank you. Just educate me from the standpoint of when you engage in your, your partners in collaboration, you mentioned planning, you mentioned housing. Mm -hmm. What's the cadre of people at the table when you engage in this dynamic in terms of collaboration? So, uh, like I said, uh, it's, it's still in its infancy stages. We're still brainstorming around what that relationship uh, looks like. Um, so, the, so, do you mean specifically the agencies or the people within the agencies? So, so I guess I will also say, so there's that piece, right? The sort of the housing and uh, the intersection between housing and schools that we're still working through. Um, and like I said, housing right now, planning. Uh, we've also been engaging in Live Baltimore in that discussion. And internally, it's been our 21st century office, my office, O&I. And, and also uh, just had a conversation yesterday about how do we include um, uh, both uh, community engagement and the internal staff that's working on the enrollment task force. Uh, so those are some of the you know, preliminary discussions, and um, we've also discussed, you know, opening up that table as needed. I will also say my office participates in the um, Surplus Schools Task Force, uh, and so that is a task force led by city planning that includes uh, the different agencies uh, to discuss and decide uh, what happens to the buildings that we surplus. Uh, and so that includes um, uh, city schools, uh, and then you have, again, housing, planning, DGS, um, sometimes a representative from the mayor's office, um, Rexham Park, just uh, really all the different city agencies who might be engaged in the eventual use of the buildings for surplusing. Okay, thank you. Next, please, the budget update. Good morning. 
uh, Courtney Desabe from the CFO's office. Uh, I'm presenting the budget update for today uh, or this month. So the first uh, section we have here is just an update on the community budget engagement that uh, we had discussed previously. We had uh, four engagements for the priority discussions at Mervo, uh, Dorothy I. Hyde, Liberty, and William Packer this past week. Uh, the William Packer one, I think, took place after our last update. Uh, we had discussed the others previously, and this one was in Spanish. And I just wanted to give a little uh, feedback on that session, having attended that session myself. I think of all the sessions, um, that one was, to me, one of the most intriguing of, of the ones that we did in terms of the makeup and the, 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 just the, the engagement, like what it, what it meant and how it felt. I'm trying not to editorialize it too much, but um, a lot of the, the, the feedback that we received at that session seemed more school level. You know, there were issues in terms of um, uh, behavior or transportation or, you know, just interactions with um, school leaders and things along those lines, which kind of said to me that this community, to a certain extent, felt or did not necessarily have the right avenues to express um, their issues or their, their grievances or their opinions in a lot of um, matters. So I thought this was very important that we had this engagement, that they were able to come out. Um, the staff from FC and Communications did a fantastic job in terms of getting the, the community members to actually engage, which has been an issue, as I understand it, in the past, where even when they attended um, specific events, they were very reluctant to share their opinions on those events or on the matters in their communities. So um, credit to the staff there. Um, All together from the different events, we um, so far have received a number of paper responses for the priorities and um, online survey responses. We closed the survey um, today. There will be a presentation next week on the 22nd at the public board meeting where we'll be sharing with you the results of the surveys from the community um, feedback forms. So of the 28 priorities, essentially we're going to say this is um, what the response has been on the different priorities, which ones were the highest and lowest. Yes, sir. Um. I've always been sensitive to the staff's time yeah. in terms of going out in evenings to these meetings. I assume it's overtime or people are doing volunteering their time. I'm not sure how that works, but I think it would be useful to have some metrics tied to these. You might have them in terms of how many people showed up, how many people submitted paper responses, yeah. email responses, and if you could get that to us um, before the board meeting. I'd like to get a sense of that. Yeah, we should be able to do that. Um, FCE took attendance for all the meetings and uh, had people sign up yeah, and I mean, feedback if, forms. Uh, those, I'm thinking of those are three metrics, who showed up, who submitted paper, who submitted email. There might be a couple others, but if, if, if you come up with others, you could just submit that to us before the meeting. Thanks. Sure. I will say as the, um, as the engagements went on, the, the number of people attending also increased. Um, so we did see um, at William Packer probably the largest group that we'd had um, to date. We had a pretty good turnout at Liberty as well. Um, the only one that was really under attended, I would say, was the first one in Mervo, um, where we had probably about six or seven community members. We had more staff members than community members. The other engagements, there, were, there was a lot more um, community involvement. Um, I'd say, estimating, I'll get FC to confirm, but somewhere in the region of maybe 15 to 30 or so um, for some of the others. Just the other two, okay. yeah. Dorothy and okay. Robert. And as, um, as we had discussed before, there were a lot of staff members and chiefs present. They were presenting the priorities, so we had a lot of people from central office um, there on hand um, to interact during the meeting, but also after the meeting, there was a lot of you know, sidebar conversations of people asking about different things taking place in central office. So um, some of those other interactions, which were not really planned, were actually pretty informative as well. And um, in regard to William Pack, I shared this with staff, but I just wanted to share it publicly. Uh, Commissioner Berkeley was able to attend, and she was very impressed. Uh, they also had this technology where people could put on the headsets and hear the same thing be presented in English. So, and she also thought staff did a great job on that. So just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Um, I, I, did you, were you going to say something? Uh, no, not okay. on that. No. Um, the four schools that you attend, is that the total that you're going to attend for this semester, for this year, for, to, to introduce the budget or have discussions about the budget? So they, these were the, the district priority-wide discussions. So these are in, essentially the feedback sessions on the priorities presented by the chiefs, which we are going through the process of implementing this month and over the next month. So there are no other um, engagements planned. The reason why I said it, and I keep repeating it, I think it's in the records that I keep saying it. I'm looking at, and I think you did a great job. Always remember that I'm just adding to what you're doing. Because when I look at the four schools, there's some missing pieces when you look at the whole picture of Baltimore City. You know, for example, I always go out further. 
like Edmondson, Edmondson Avenue, or um, I always mention uh, Cherry Hill, or um, it's always, uh, we, we still haven't reached out far enough to get some of the community, because when I look at the schools, which you did a great job, is do, will these people travel that distance to come to these schools? And um, I don't know if you've already attended some of these schools and found that you don't get a great attendance. Maybe that's the reason. Yeah, we did some sure. of those last year, um, and the attendance, like you know, was hit and miss. Right. Um, but FCE did come uh, when we had this update last month. Um, we had Sabrina Sutton, uh, ED from FCE, and she came in and she explained some of the reasoning behind the locations. And I think a lot of it was related to timing as well. Okay. Within the Christmas period, trying to schedule these mm -hmm. dates was very difficult. We actually had to move on one or two of those dates just to try and get them to right. fit in. And we really didn't want to have two of those in the same week, but those were the only dates available. Okay, sure. Yeah. I, I, I say that because in our audience every two weeks, every two weeks, we have a lady who comes all the way from Edmondson Avenue, Edmondson right. Village, Edmondson High School, and she continues to mention the fact to us that when are they going to come out to our area? And I've been saying this for a while. <clears throat> so we still have to look at some of the areas that we're not reaching out to. And I, I said this before, mm -hmm. and for example... I go all the way down to South Baltimore. I cannot see some of the community members coming to some of these areas here from Cherry Hill. However, they have a strong community organization in Cherry Hill. And I would think that if we could reach out to their community groups and everything to let them know that, and they meet at churches. I think Cherry Hill Presbyterian Church, it used to be there. I'm not sure. I'm not good. But it's something maybe at the schools. But if we could let them know that we're coming and so they can say, okay, we have X amount of people that will probably show up, I think those people have a right to have um, uh, a visit and talk about the budget because, you know, they're pretty active down there, whether we know it or not. It's just some of the areas that we don't have. I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong, everything is right, but we still have to spend time thinking about the areas that we're not, that we're missing, okay? Mm -hmm. Not true. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Nope, no problem. Could you share, was there a presentation at these district-wide discussions? Uh, there was a presentation in addition to a, a video which was put together by the students, um, which I had discussed before, that, that will be shared at the meeting on the 22nd. Could you share both of those with, with us? If we have Part it, I apologize, sure. but I'd yeah, like to see that. both. Thank you. Thank you. I went to the uh, Liberty uh, one. The, the kid did a really good job with the... Uh, video and we had they had department heads yes chiefs. I guess you had at least five chiefs that spoke so it's pretty dynamic and same people ask the same questions it was like two people dominated but <laughs> but I guess by and large uh, the turnout was good uh, the pre presentations were pretty great uh, but uh, it'd be good to see those I'd welcome yeah, we can send those on Liberty turnout at Liberty I think was about 40 people I think a lot of some of that would have been um, district staff as yes. well. So I'd probably yeah. Hedge so you had fifteen and thirty-five, probably. Probably, yeah. 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 Fifteen was probably staff. Yeah. 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 That could be skewing it wrong, but yeah. it, it's it's close to there. Like we we can get um like I said those numbers from FC. They took attendance for everyone who attended. Okay. In addition <laughs> to that, you send that notice out all over citywide uh, that yeah. you can also come to that meeting. They, is I, that what you do? I can't give you all the details on it. FCE um, handles the details of the notifications. Okay. I do know that they try to target specifically um, the schools in the areas okay. and the community in the areas where we're presenting at that particular time, but there are district-wide notifications so like on the website, et cetera, and Facebook. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next page here we have the uh, budget development timeline. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of these. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail. If you do have questions, yeah, I can drill in, but I'm going to go through what some of these items are. Uh, where we are at the process right now in January, this is really the culmination of a lot of different um, phases of the budget development process. Um, we're at the point in time where right now we're awaiting the governor's announcement for the, the um, revenue allocations so we know what the school allocations will be. Um, so a lot of these processes and a lot of our final determinations um, are dependent on, on those numbers. But where we are right now, um, budget guidance development um, has been taking place over the last month. 
Um, those The guidance document is compiled currently and being reviewed by the different offices who submitted information. Then we're going to pass that information along to the ILEDs to take a look at it as well before we send it out to schools. Um, we're tweaking the, the guidance document and the information. And what we're also going to do is pull out the information that is significantly changed from the previous year so we kind of create a cheat sheet for school leaders so they can at a glance identify the things that have been adjusted. Um, the next thing is the enrollment projection development. Um, we have the, the draft of the enrollment projections right now. Um, we actually have a meeting today internally to go through the initial projections. And this is where we, we take a look at the raw numbers from the projections and we say this school situation has changed or this has been updated or this grade configuration has changed, this um, you know, classes have been moved, et cetera. And we take into account the, the information from the portfolio decisions that you guys made in the previous public board meeting as well and incorporate that into the port into the the projections. Um, once we finish with that, the projections go out to school leaders and school principals. They take a look at the numbers for their individual schools. They say yes, they agree or they disagree or this should be changed and they send that information back to us as well. We determine um, with the panel in central office how much of that information we take. You know, not you may think that you know most school leaders are advocating for increased numbers. That's not always the case. There's some people who say that based on things they've seen in their community, those numbers should actually be lowered a little bit or based on um, you know, just the experience or communications that they've had with parents or things that they're seeing that we should tweak the numbers one direction or the other. So we take those into account in making the final adjustment that we use for the allocations to schools. Um, next here, like I said, we have the finalized revenue. That's a, a broad date. We don't know the exact date um, when we're getting the information, but we expect it to be sometime within the next week. And then the school allocation development will be based on what that revenue allocation is. So the budget tool dates have remained the same. They were going to be from February 8th to um, March 8th. And within there, we're also going to have our central office budget development process. And this is where we take into account the information and feedback that we've done through those priority engagement sessions in developing the central office budgets um, by the chiefs. Um, also within that time period, and I, I didn't put it on here, is the... Um, the school budget collaboratives, which we had discussed previously. That's where we bring every school in, um, sit them in with a team of staff from central office. So they have human capital support, they have budget support, they have special education support, they have Title I support. So they sit at the table with everyone in their LED after planning out their budget and they go through the process of actually building their budget on site here with the team. Again, the emphasis, as in previous years, is to, to make sure that school leaders are not making these decisions in isolation, that they have the support necessary, they have the guidance necessary, they have all the information on hand. If there are conflicts or if there are, there are um, issues that need to be brought up, the staff is on hand and available to resolve those as soon as possible. We found that that aids us not just in developing better budgets at the school level, but also speeding the process along, not having to you know s wait for people people to review and submit things at different time periods, you can kind of get more of it done on hand and on site at the same time. That's not to say that everyone leaves with a balanced budget. I and mean, we know every school is unique, every situation is unique. So a lot of times there there is background work that has to be done to get the budgets finalized. But we have found that that process, um, which we've done over the last two years, has aided the, the timeline in getting things done in a timely manner. Um, after that, we have the budget reconciliation process. Human Capital has done a lot of work over the last uh, couple of years to refine that process. Usually that was a process um, that took five to six weeks. They have it down to about a two-week process now. And it's essentially where you take all the information that's loaded into the budget tools, um, both central, schools, and grants. They compile that information and essentially um, troubleshoot it, make sure there are no errors, there's no duplications, that all the information, all the dollars fit together, all the FTE information fits together. And that goes into our budget book development and the development for the presentation to you on... Um, April 1st, well, we do the initial development from April 1st to April 8th, and the presentation is on April 9th, and then the board vote on April 23rd. Um, any questions on the timeline here? Like I said, this is pretty high level. This actual calendar is like, you know, 200 items, you know, of all the little steps that we do in between to kind of make these things happen. So I just kind of summarize these. Very good. Thank okay. You. Yeah, thank you so much. That's no questions, questions for me. Any right. questions from commissioners? I just, I just curious. Yes, sir. I mean, looking one and two seems like no brainers, but three on down. Is that a function of what the governor's going to do? So we have. I mean, does he drive all the the other points? It it drives all those things, but we would be in um in serious trouble if we waited, you know, for the numbers for us to start kind of thinking on how we're going to plan these. So right now, we're what we do is we have three or four different scenarios and contingencies in terms of how we're going to build things out. Um, you know, and a lot of these, you know, we're very reluctant to, to, to 
you know, expand on too much. You don't want to create the wrong atmosphere depending on, on what actually happens. So we're, we, we're very dependent on what those final numbers end up being for us to share that information out and for us to make a final decision. But we do work through different scenarios and different probabilities depending on what we think may occur in our own projections. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. No problem. Okay, we're moving along pretty well. Information Technology Annual Update. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is uh, Sashi Badala. I'm the Interim Chief uh, Information Technology Officer. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity to pro present the annual update for IT. My name is Armas P. Carbon. I'm the Special Assistant to the CIO. And my name is Elvis Tia, Director of IT Infrastructure and Security. So we're going to get started with the uh, high-level roles and responsibility for information technology. Uh, basically, we provide the infrastructure and application support, whether it is uh, the, you know, teaching and learning, whether it's communications, whether it's business systems, and also the assessment system. On a broad scale, uh, we do that. Uh, in addition to that, we provide the technical support for all the technology in the district, whether it's computers, cell phones, other devices. And then the most important thing is to secure the data system. We want to make sure our systems are secured, our data for our students and employees is secured. So we take uh, that really seriously to make sure that uh, we, per, we put those security um, up front. On the technology footprint, uh, just a high level um, overview, we have about 100,000 uh, email accounts. Uh, we have about 3,000 audiovisual technology, whether it's smart boards, audiovisual. Uh, we have about 4,000 access points, you know, and making sure we have the wireless uh, in the schools and everything. Uh, we process close to 14 million uh, emails annually, and we have about 1,500 virtual desktops, 4,000 copiers, uh, 500 plus servers. Uh, we have about 65,000 desktop, laptops, Chromebooks, you know, uh, tablets, and also, uh, you know, uh, 2,500 wife phones. And, uh, and uh, our service desk process over 100,000 service uh, tickets every year. Uh, and we have over 150 applications uh, all the way from HR, your payroll, your benefits, your GL, your a a AP, accounts receivable, procurement, there's a whole lot. Can I say something real quick? Sure. It's a higher education and education person. I'm looking at this, I'm saying, what the heck is this? <laughs> this is a joke. <laughs> no, it's very interesting, and I was trying to put it all together. Yeah, now I'll go home and practice going through this whole process. Right. And there's a lot of technology out there, so I think uh, we basically, to, you know, take a back step and say, okay, how do we present in one slide, mm -hmm. just uh, present a whole landscape of technology? Yeah, so that it's good because now, as a professor, I'm going to go back and evaluate this and dissect this whole thing right here. Sure. And when next time I see you, I'm going to be teaching this class to you. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, other than the, the previous slide for your target spoke about the high level uh, technology support we provide, there's some major bodies of work uh, we actually uh, provide support to. Starting from Jan, the whole budget development process which happens we provide a lot of technical support to make sure the budget tools are up and running, the, the technical support. The 21st century school moves, as you know, every time school moves to a swing space, we have to move the technology. Uh, when a new school is set up, we have to make sure the technology is available for the school. So there's a lot of uh, support which is provided. Uh, again, the E-Rate initiatives, what we get from our uh, FEDs uh, regarding the internet connectivity, our telephone. So we work with uh, filing those on a timely basis. Uh, again, the park testing, you know, we provide the technical support, including your graduation and report card processing in the, in the May, make sure our seniors get the information they need on a timely basis, schools are supported. Uh, 
Moving on, uh, school year in activities again, um, making sure the technology up to date with uh, all the technology patches and everything is uh, ready for the school uh, summer school. Then once the uh, budgets are loaded, uh, we have to make sure July the systems are up and running, whether it is procurement, whether loading the positions back into our HR systems, whether loading the budgets into the uh, core financial system, we do that, we support that uh, activities. And then uh, later on, we also make sure our student information system is uh, ready for next school year. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, uh, September, we talk about uh, enrollment, uh, open enrollment for our employees, and we support those activities. Um, again, October, we do a whole lot of uh, uh, technical support for the school choice and online choice registration. Um, in November, we do a lot of system maintenance from the security point of view. Uh, December, again, we get ready to make sure the W-2s are issued on time, the 1098s are issued on time, making sure all the systems are up and running and getting ready for the new uh, calendar year. Uh, then I think the big thing is IT support. We provide a lot of technical support with the technology landscape you just saw, uh, both for students and staff. Uh, just on a high level, the budget and FTE overview, um, again, if you look at uh, this year's budget, it's a $1.15 billion budget for school district. Uh, IT budget is about $19.6 million. Um, that's uh, about 1.6% uh, of the overall budget. Uh, we have about 61 FTEs. Uh, so again, if you look at our budget, majority of the 70% of the budget is devoted towards your utilities and contract maintenance, whether it is software support maintenance, hardware support maintenance, or uh, your internet, your telephone, that's pretty much the major chunk of the money goes, and then the 30% goes to the personnel. Again, uh, if you look at from the last 10 years, uh, the whole information technology landscape has changed, right? If you look around, probably about four or five years, there was nothing called about cybersecurity. We hear security breaches happening every day in the newspapers, what happened, and we take a lot of effort to make sure our information is protected, our, uh, our employee and student information uh, is protected. There's a lot of things we do, but again, the need has increased, right? Whether it is a instructional need, whether it is security, what I was just talking about, uh, we're setting up new buildings, the support to the 21st century school, uh, the need for wireless access, application, there's a several uh, different things and, and the landscape has really increased. Uh, but again, uh, if you look at the technology resources, we lost a 44% reduction in the operational budget when you compare to last 10 years, right? The last 10 years where we were, uh, we were about 30, 35 million, right now we're about 20 million. And uh, even the FTEs, uh, we're about almost 50% reduction in the FTEs when you compare uh, to uh, 2008. Uh, obviously, we are looking at, we're working with finance to see if there's opportunities to tap into some capital funding, so some of the support we need to upgrade our hardware and software. Uh, again, we're working with, uh, to make sure that district priorities, you know, we, we take a closer look at what IT, uh, what kind of support we need for IT to make sure it's properly funded. Okay, so, so moving along, we, uh, my chief previously talked about security. Um, in the past year, we've had a lot of issues with uh, our, a lot of attempts from a cyber perspective. So we have added a whole new layer of security by engaging Microsoft and other entities to give us better protection. So if you look on the screen, we got, um, we've implemented several um, levels for daily threats, phishing, impersonation, infiltration, et cetera. Um, we also have physical security enhancement. Um, before you could just access certain offices downstairs, now we have restricted those offices because of the kind of data we have in there. Um, also, modernizing our infrastructure system, right? So we're looking at deploying cloud, deploy, deploying cloud services to reduce costs. That is mainly reducing our footprint in our data center because there are some things now we can push to the cloud as compared to having it physically on site, which will be more expensive because you have to pay for maintenance. And we also have our IT day-to-day -day operation functions. Um, this slide here, uh, so the last time we look at this slide, there's a comparison from 2016 up to Jan of 2018. We can see that more 
um, institutions, uh, um, educational institutions have been attacked. The number has increased by a little over 100. It used to be 283, um, now it's 395. So we are increasing our measures. Um, recently, there were concerns about, you know, when you check your email, you see things like um, we put a banner up top of all of our BCPSS users, consultizing people that if you don't know where it comes from, you're not sure of it, send us a message so that we can make sure that your information is secure or if somebody's trying to impersonate, we can take action immediately. So this screen just shows um, the increase in vulnerability throughout the United States, not just the body mode system, but how the security attacks are increasing daily. And then we also consider, you know, how we think about security right now. We look at the people, we look at the process, and then we look at the technology. For the most part, our weakest link is our people, so we have to make sure the people are well educated and are always informed and reminded of new ways that hackers or whomever try to attack the district will try to infiltrate our system. And then we also concentrate on the processes, right? So our management system, our policies, our procedures, um, a lot of different things, including drills of audits and stuff. We've been, right now we're looking at um, how to test our users to so send them phishing attempts to see how they're going to respond to that. There are other things we're looking at to make sure that they are always aware. And then we have also improved our technology in terms of our antivirus, our firewalls. We have upgraded our firewalls almost three times since the last, in the last past um, six months, just to make sure we're up to standard. Um, our, we have also in, improved our in, intrusion detection systems. Um, switch updates, we do that regularly now. And we're also doing testing. We do functional testing, we do vulnerability scanning, which is attempting to access your network from outside the network to see if you are vulnerable, to make sure that you can fix anything that you see before hackers can see that. And we also do, and then another form of it is penetration testing. You, you intentionally target your own system and see if you can penetrate your system. That just hardens the system. Um, and then just to add on our advanced threat protection, that is um, things we put in place because most times we are compromised through email communication. So we have a new level of phishing protection. Um, we have attachment scanning. Before, about a year ago, you could just, somebody would send you an attachment and you download the attachment. And now if, but it is invisible to the user, but if somebody sends a BCPSS user an attachment, it takes a little while, maybe two minutes before it gets there because we have a system in the back end that has to scan that attachment, make sure it's safe. If it is not safe, you will get an email saying this attachment wasn't safe, so it was not delivered. Um, and then there's also impersonation protection. There have been many times where the C we will get an email or our users will get an email saying it came from the CEO, but it is not the CEO. And we've tried to, you know, consultize our users to look at the, not just the display name, but the source, the actual email address. But most times when people see stuff from the CEO, they get excited and they click it before you even look at the actual address. So we have implemented something called impersonation, which is if the CEO's display name is the same as our email address, yes, then it's legitimate. But if it comes from Yahoo or Google.com, but then it says Dr. Santa Lisa, then that's because it, it can be. So that's something we have implemented to, to mitigate that. And then we also have implemented geo restriction. So now we're not getting email from the Middle East, like Iraq, Afghanistan, the city school, we're not doing business with those people, so we don't want emails from them. Because that's where most of the attacks came from. So the United States, um, Canada, and few other countries, yes. By default, if you're not part of those countries, then you have to talk to ITD for your email to come in. So if somebody's doing business with somebody, maybe in China or Russia, your school system, you have to let us know that I'm doing business with this company, then we're going to give access to their emails. And so, and we also had a conference at our professional development center to, we had about, um, it is some more schools present to let them know of new technologies and stuff. 
because we want to engage the schools, the principals, to let them know that this is a new technology because we believe it will assist them in making decisions in buying technology for the schools. Um, so we've also onboarded a new security manager to help with security in our environment. And things are working. We're working on policies and procedures right now to be able to protect our system more. Um, and another important thing is, uh, I'm just going to go to the last bullet there, facilities, third-party vendor integrations, because we, everybody, the HVAC system, heating and cooling in the schools is a big thing. We have, we have already built our infrastructure in the back end to accommodate what facilities is going to be coming at us with. Um, in terms of monitoring system, the building automation, automation system, which is the bar system, so we have systems already to accommodate that because pretty soon, you know, um, um, Dr. Blake here knows about what I'm talking about. Pretty soon, they're going to want to access these resources. The public going to want to access certain level of resources to know what is happening in the schools in terms of temperature. So we've already, we are building up our system to support that. Um, so right now we have professional development opportunity. As I talked about this previously at PDC, and we intend to do more. We had about 300 attendees. We had about 85 schools represented, about 30 vendors from Microsoft, Cisco, all of the great um, vendors that have interest in LEAs and in, in, in education. They were there to present their technologies, and schools saw that. And we ourselves, we were excited because now we can always bring together this kind of program, and schools can come in to see the new technology to see how it assists. And they can also talk to these vendors directly to let them know what they need. You, you've had this already? Yeah, we've had one session already. When was it? It was um, our professional development center, oh. North in Parkway. I don't so, know. So, uh, Commissioner, this was conducted in October. Uh, this was the first time we have done in city schools because we have a lot of uh, great uh, systems, tools, and technologies where our uh, teachers can benefit, our, our, our uh, educators can benefit out of it. So what we did is we hosted this um, kind of, I would say, probably in a, a smaller scale just to see what the appetite is because we're doing that for the first time. Uh, we invited some vendors like Microsoft and Google and Apple. They came in. They basically uh, spoke about the technology which is available for them in the school district and how they can use it. So it was a uh, 300 teachers, uh, in fact, have attended. Uh, it was a great uh, success. And we, we want to expand that probably next year uh, to a much larger and invite more uh, attendees. I wish the that. board had have known that I would have liked to have attended. Absolutely. We will make sure. And again, yeah. um, you know, next next year we are we're going to do that in a much larger scale. Yeah. And we are happy to uh, Any scale. That. I would. I think we would sure, like to, absolutely. to be yeah. there. Yeah. That sounds... Exciting! I would love yeah. to have attend. Yeah, in, in fact, we have some great. Uh, we have we have put together a story for the whole thing. How how many teachers attended and what all they learned and everything. I'll, I'll be more than happy to kind of forward that uh, feedback from those educators who attended session. And just to wrap up, uh, looking ahead, there are three main strategic focus areas uh, we're going to be handling in the IT office. Uh, they are a focus on comprehensive security, technology enhancements, and a technology refresh strategy. So what that means in terms of um, comprehensive security, uh, it means uh, implementing things like multi-factor authentication to further uh, secure our environment. So instead of just logging into your um, services with an email and a password, uh, you may also be prompted for a PIN number uh, that is generated from your phone uh, to, ver to further verify your identity. Um, and a host of other uh, security enhancements, uh, including um, identity management. So we want to think about security and, and a user's identity in the district as one single entity, one thing that they could use it to log into all district services. So we're getting close to those types of solutions. And uh, as Elvis uh, mentioned, we do want to continue building out our policies and the governance around uh, security in the district. When we talk about technology enhancements, uh, the district there, in the district there is a need uh, to modernize our business application environment, our enterprise resource 
environment. So that is your Oracle. The, this is a tool that facilitates our payroll, our finances, or human capital, uh, the backbone of the district. So we are looking at uh, how can we update and modernize that 20-year-old technology in the district to allow us to work more efficiently from a business unit perspective. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're also looking at um, the instructional management system. Uh, currently, one of the big ones that we have in the district is Blackboard. Um, we're looking at, again, modernizing that tool, seeing what else is out there uh, to benefit our, our district students and staff. And looking at additional ways to leverage E-rate, federal E-rate funding um, to bring additional wireless and switches and hardware into school buildings as well. And finally, uh, we are starting to have conversations around a technology refresh strategy. Uh, what would it look like to leverage economy of scale to ensure that in the district, student and staff has access to a device to support either their learning or their working environment? Um, some schools around the district has done it through a one-to-one -one type of approach where every student, every staff has a device available to them. Uh, we're looking at a mix in the district Maybe not a one-to-one, -one, but what does that ratio look like to help promote equitable, equitability uh, in device distribution throughout the district? So this is an early conversation, um, but it's something that we think needs to occur so that all students have access, um, and we need to plan that out appropriately. Any questions? Commissioner. Oh, I have two. Uh, I guess the first, uh, 2007, your budget was 35 million. Twelve years later, it's 20 million. Correct. You talked about needing Oracle, uh, modernized Blackboard, additional hardware and software. But say you had another 20 million, where would that go? Um, <clears throat> That's my first question. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, Definitely over the last 10 years, um, Commissioner, we definitely lost a lot of funding. Um, obviously, this district is kind of uh, constrained for the whole funding thing. But again, to answer your question, um, the the highest need right now is on the security, all right? Um, obviously, we want to make sure our information um, uh, relating to our employees and our students is protected, uh, especially with what we're dealing out there. And we, we get hit with almost about 1,000 uh, attacks in a given day. So we want to make sure that our uh, environment is protected, and we want to make sure the tools, the, the people who need to be looking for those threats and make, uh, take corrective actions is in place. And again, the second part of that would be uh, modernizing some of our uh, um, some old antiquated systems. An example is ERP, our ERP system, what we use for our payroll, HR, uh, our GL, uh, all those systems. It's almost 20 years. We implemented it back in 1999. Uh, so it's time to kind of modernize because the need, the business need is something which uh, uh, which is tremendously going. So I would say the system capabilities, which is almost 20 years, has outgrown it. So we have to go back and look at uh, what we can do. So obviously that's another um, you know area we would, we would like to look at. Thank you. Sure. My uh, second question is, you talked a lot about security, but where is that black swan that you have to that keeps you up at night? <laughs> I would say. Um, the one big thing which keeps me at it night is make sure that our systems and data is protected. So we have put in a lot of measures over the last one year. And again, I don't know whether you're aware of it. And I did a uh, presentation in the Council of Grishity Schools in Baltimore. I think it was in October. Um, so 2017, November, in fact, we were attacked. Um, uh, we were attacked. It was a pretty significant cyber attack. Fortunately, there was no financial loss. Uh, because there are certain underlying checks which prevented. Uh, but again, a lot of school districts in Maryland, in Maryland, like, you know, I don't want to name any school district, but there were a lot of financial, uh, you know, uh, loss. Um, so um, obviously that's one big thing which keeps me awake at night. Uh, we, we have done a lot of things over the last one year, but there's a lot of other things to do in addition things to do, absolutely. I have a few questions. First, this is really a terrific presentation. I don't think we've seen something like it. So it really gave us a lot of information. And the 
sort of downside of a lot of information is it creates lots of questions <laughs> that we wouldn't have asked absent the presentation. Uh, one question is, a couple of years ago, um, there was discussion, I believe, by a predecessor in your position about a grant from Baltimore Development Corporation to participate in some program where our fiber might connect with some other fiber. Uh, does that ring a bell at all with any of you? Yes? Yes, sir. I think he's talking about it, Wayne. Okay. So that is the um, our fiber solicitation that is out on the streets right now. Um, we, we had to put it back up on the street because when we contacted USAC, there were some other requirements that it said we had to meet. It had to stay, stay longer on the street than it was previously, so it's out on the street right now. But just for a high-level explanation, yeah. the intention is to connect all of our schools to each other via a fiber connection versus having a third party like Comcast um, connecting our schools for us. Because the challenge we have in that is, is twofold. The first thing is, as we grow in terms of, of devices in the school, the speed, which is also the bandwidth requirement that the school will grow. And so right now, we are between most of our school are one gig in terms of speed. Now, we cannot go higher than that in terms of the contract we have. If we, if we try to do that, then the, the vendor is going to charge us more. So, but if we have our own connection to these schools, we can even increase up to 10 times the amount of speed we have right now, and it's, it's going to be almost costless to us. The next thing is all of our WAN, which is the connection that go to the schools right now, are sub greatly subsidized by USAC, which is we also call E rate. They yeah. pay around eighty five percent of that. Mm -hmm. We don't know when these when the federal government is gonna say, Okay, we're gonna shut this program down and we're not gonna subsidize you anymore in terms of paying eighty five percent for at for every school. So if we implement the WAN, then even if they shut it down, we would have already have our system in place. So we're trying to implement it now while USAC is still available to assist in terms of pricing. Is it? Okay. Thank you. Um, I got about 20% of that, but I, my colleague to the right says it's a good thing. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. I just, it's way over my head, but thank you for answering the question. The, um, the other question is, or comment, is that one of the things that I thought was missing from your presentation was customer service and how you're doing in terms of serving the customer. I mean, you, you, everything you're doing is making life easier for parents and teachers and students through the apps and service that you provide. Um, but I didn't see anything about an emphasis on improving or measuring how you're doing in terms of responding to tickets or other ways that affect the lives of the people that are using our schools every day? Because everything is digital now. I mean, virtually everything is. And so you guys affect virtually everything. And the degree that it's functioning well at a high, you know, high level and that problems are being solved is, has an enormous impact on the experience of our teachers and parents and kids. So I think I would just ask, in addition to this really terrific presentation, you could either add or maybe there's a separate one. And this is connected to the work that the, you might know the enrollment work group talked about customer service as a way of keeping families in our schools and attracting families to schools. And again, a lot of that is what our parents and those that choose schools are experiencing online. So if you could make that a subject of a future um, presentation or a separate presentation, I think um, I'd like to see that. Yeah. Absolutely, and uh, thank you. That's a great point, uh, Commissioner. We'll definitely add that to our future updates. Uh, we have done a lot of things from the customer service point of view, but uh, we would definitely like to highlight in that presentation. Thanks. Absolutely. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> I thought that was an excellent presentation. I hadn't seen one of those. And, and I just want to mention, I'm going to say this briefly. This reminds me of, I came from high ed. In the 80s when we started uh, all of the technology and the beginning of technology, and we're at the point right, right now where we're so advanced with technology. However, there's so many things going on as far as theft and fraud and all the things that could affect all of the systems 
that we're almost back to, in my opinion, back to the 80s starting all over because of what we have, we're trying to save it and prevent all of these crazy things from happening. And on what you have presented, and I don't know if you've presented it like this before, in the, not in the two years that I've been here, and it gives us an opportunity to go in here and look at what you put in here and spend some time evaluating. What I would like to see happen, and, I don't, and I'm sure other people would as well, is you just did that uh, program in October, you said, we have so many people coming and going at different points in the system. This is something that we really need to spend some time looking at, absolutely, because we never know enough, especially the layman here or anybody who doesn't know in detail what you're talking about, because I'm going to be evaluating this myself. But we need to get this out there, and you did it in October. We should do it again. I'm not sure if we could do it twice a year, but you might have to in the summertime when teachers and, and administrators are off during the summer. But this is an excellent, excellent opportunity for us to really understand what's going on in the system and ask questions. So I just want to thank you for this. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. We definitely look into that and uh, see the opportunity to make it a couple of times every year. Yeah, so, I think it's, yeah. it's critical. And when you look at what's going on nationally and internationally with the system and whatever, <laughs> I won't go into that in detail, but right. it's uh, something that we really have to pay close attention to understand that at any point our whole system can shut down, at least in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, again, I've said there's a great point you made. Uh, you know, technology is like a, we go through a cycle, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, you're going back to what it was about 20, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, uh, looking at the, uh, you know, the cyber threats and what's happening around and everything, mm -hmm. you know, you go back uh, to that. So it's a, it, that, that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay. Okay, may we have procurement? And, um, let me say something before we get started with procurement. One of our commissioners who's on the policy committee sent a list of questions, and um, quite a list of questions. So we copied the questions, and I'm going to send it to you as well, but I'm going to read the first part that goes it's um, from 1 to 11. And his question, and you can incorporate it into whatever you have to say, but you don't have to go into detail, but I'll send the mm -hmm. question to you, but for the public and for transparency purposes. Let me just read it to you. This procurement requests are directly aligned to the blueprint work. No, his question is these uh, procurement requests, requests are directly aligned to the blueprint work. Is that right? And then how does this request align to our budget? That's for questions from, I mean, procurement 1 through 11. This is related to 1 through 11. I see that schools will absorb some of the costs of some items. However, how does this impact monies, grants already set aside for blueprint work. How will information about these programs be communicated to schools or have schools been predetermined, hopefully data driven if so, to benefit from this procurement items? And how will the effectiveness of these programs be monitored over time? I, I know I read a whole lot of questions. Mm -hmm. However, um, I'll give you a copy and I'll send you a copy. And um, you can also. Oh, Commissioner, they already have a copy of it. My speaker was off. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so you have a copy of the questions from one to eleven. They they have all they have all the cop they have the question of all the co the questions they have a copy of all the questions. Wasn't that the public does? Yes. Okay. <laughs> or, oh, I'm hoping that the public. Well, when does. you yeah, when you ask them now, the public will. <laughs> <laughs> okay then. So um, there's four, three other questions, but the, but when you get to the particular procurement, I'll just ask the short question. I know I put you on the spot, didn't I? Great. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Jeff Parker, Director of Procurement. Uh, as you mentioned, Commissioner, uh, uh, items 1 through 11 are all related to a specific scope of work uh, in academics. Uh, I've asked Casey to uh, join me at the table uh, to sort of go over uh, the purpose of these contracts and initiatives. Okay. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, my name is Casey Mengel. I'm the Special Assistant to the Chief Academic Officer here in City Schools. So the first 
subset of procurement items, numbers 1 through 11, um, as you referenced, were all brought in through a recent uh, pre-qualification services uh, opportunity, or a PQS. So it's where the Student Wholeness Office, as well as others from related services, um, and across the district, including in the school's office, put together a scope of work in alignment with the blueprint to support student wholeness. So as you all are certainly aware, our blueprint asks of us, and there's a specific line item in there for it, for us to engage a panel of experts um, in order to review partners who provide services and supports aligned with our student wholeness work and our vision for that work annually. And that we then provide schools with a clear complement of those resources uh, to support the work they're doing in their schools. The PQS that launched back in the fall and is resulting in the group of um, 11 organizations that you see before you uh, was our um, initial uh, sort of foray uh, into doing this um, and into beginning to evaluate our programmatic uh, partners and bring vendors into the fold that we believe can support our blueprint work. So are these connected directly to the blueprint? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> they certainly are. Um, and they really are aligned to support the intensive learning sites. So getting to the next question about how these align to their uh, align to the budget. And I think it also goes to the follow-up question around mm -hmm. how it impacts money or grant that's set aside for the blueprint. Mm -hmm. In putting forth these partners, we have aligned. So as you know, we have 20 intensive learning sites for social emotional learning, 20 intensive learning sites that are associated with restorative practices, all under the umbrella of student wholeness. For those who are the social emotional learning intensive learning sites, since October, even a little bit before that, they've all been going through a process of assessing the needs and the resources at their school level in order to implement school-wide SEL. Part of what comes out of that needs and resources assessment is um, an SEL, a school-wide SEL plan. Within that plan, Schools are able, of course, to align funds to meet any gaps or any needs that they see um, in, their, in their school currently for implementing and accessing school-wide SEL and bringing school-wide SEL to bear for their schools. To that end, the funds that we have aligned with our intensive learning sites, particularly in Title I and in Title IV to support student wholeness, are also being leveraged to support portions of these contracts with partners. So those funds um, are aligned in a way as like almost like a Kickstarter for these schools to be able to bring these partners into bear. Um, and then over the course of the next budgeting cycle, work to bring them on more fully um, as schools would incur those costs. Of course, with any PQS, while we have aligned internal district resources to support these partners, <coughs> we also know that schools can leverage their own funds, um, albeit Title I or general dollars that they, that they also receive. So they'd be able to access these partners as well. Okay. All of those who came through our PQS process um, and something that I would love to uh, commend the procurement office in doing is really embedding the ESSA evidence of effectiveness language within our PQS documents, within the scope, and within what we end up looking for uh, from our vendors. And so while our Office of Achievement and Accountability continues to work with each of the partners to formally designate a particular level of ESSA, um, all in our evaluation through the PQS process have come in at at least a level four, which is required for Title I, and several what, of them what, what, um, as levels one and two. Sure. Sure. So essentially, um, ESSA, the uh, oh, okay. new federal policy, has right. identified different levels of effectiveness uh, for work in, work in the field, so a level four. For example, would be an organization who maybe has a logic model, is preparing to do an evaluation, and is based, their work being based on evidence-based best practices. A level three um, is an organization who has done some formalized evaluation and is able to disaggregate uh, their, their results by a particular subgroup or category, drawing more correlational lines. 
Uh, levels one and two fall into experimental and quasi-experimental designs as far as the research and evaluation of that program. City Schools has a lot of resources with regards to this um, up on our website um, in Office of Achievement and Accountability. So okay. hopefully that gives you like a quick right. taste though of yeah, what thank those you. are. For the rest of the questions that you have the list, could you just submit those answers to the questions so we can move? But thank you so much. Oh, of you, course. You, did you, were you finished? I certainly can be. Uh, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that I addressed uh, that I addressed each of those um, you did. You for did you. A great so job. as long as you all are satisfied, happy to put something into writing for okay, the board. Okay, that would be great. Okay, My pleasure. That would, thank you so much. That was a, a lot of questions. Do you have a question, Commissioner? Do we have a copy of this question? Um, I can send those to you. They came from Commissioner. Uh, McFadden. Yeah, for mm -hmm. Okay, I certainly would. Thank you so much. <laughs> and you can, um, you have the questions, and could you just send those answers to us? And we'll move on, yeah. unless they ask the same question throughout. But we have a number of um, uh, procurement here. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kirsten. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so uh, we'll move on to item 10.12, if that's all right with the board. Uh, this is a contract with Kennedy Krieger. Um, the contract funds two fellows to attend the Kennedy Krieger Center for Innovation in, for the Center Innovation and Leadership in Special Education. The cost is $100,000. What page is that? 45. Uh, the next contract is with the Johns Hopkins. Uh, this is a request of the board to increase the existing contract with Johns Hopkins, um, which is part of an MOU that we have with Johns Hopkins and Morgan uh, to contract with Burke, the Baltimore Education Research Curriculum, um, to provide a comprehensive review and assessment of city schools' uh, CTE programs and their effectiveness. The next contract, thank you, Rachel. The next contract is with Shepard Pratt. Uh, the purpose of this contract is to provide professional development, ongoing training and support. Um, the contract is uh, to provide intervention for students with aggressive and disruptive behaviors. Uh, the intervention focuses on helping students improve organizational skills, set goals, develop awareness of feelings and skills to manage them learn to take the perspective of others as well as increase resistance to peer pressure as well as build relationships. The contract amount is $75,000. Excuse me, how, how do schools um, access this resource? Yes, please. I'm Stephanie Parkhurst, and I am um, a coach with the CEIS grant, Coordinated Early Intervening Services. Uh, Eric Manzak, the Coordinator of Prevention and Intervention, Restorative Practice, under the, uh, under the Whole Child Office. Um, as part of the CEIS grant, we have um, coaches who are assigned to the 21 schools. Um, specifically to provide support and coaching around climate and behavior. And so what we are doing is providing schools with information um, about coping power and then, um, you know, helping them think through how it could be implemented in their building. It is a middle grades program, so it is for, um, you know, just that group of, of grade levels in those schools. Or you can proceed. Thank you. The next contract is with Data Bank IMX. Uh, purpose of this contract is to provide uh, conversion of paper documents into digital formats. Uh, the estimated annual amount is $40,000 per year. 
The contract term is from January 2019 through December 31st of 2019. The next contract is with Verizon. This is a request to increase the existing contract with Verizon by $1.2 million. Uh, the contract provides local telephone service, uh, such as 1,300 Centrex phone lines and 1,400 uh, plain old telephone lines. Uh, the contract also provides fax communication and security alarm services for all facilities. The next contract is with Femdal LLC. The purpose of this contract is to provide telephone and maintenance services to our network. Uh, the estimated total contract amount is $1,042,000. Uh, the contract term is January 23rd, 2019 through January 22nd, 2022. Contract includes one two year renewal option. The next contract is with Denver ELEC. Uh, the purpose of this contract is to renovate uh, the HVAC systems at Roland Park Elementary Middle School. The contract amount is $6,727,600. The next contract is with Chilmar. <laughs> the next contract is with Chilmar. Sorry. So the, yeah, the Roland Park yes, sir. number really stands out. How does this relate to the capital budget that we heard of, we heard about earlier? And I thought there was, anyway, if you could just speak to this project. Sure, it was, it's actually included in the FY19 CIP allocation, and that's actually quite in line with what was allocated for okay. that project in the state uh, CIP award for that project. Um, this is the third phase of in the HVAC complete overall at, at that building. It had been rescinded in the past because the bids did come in too high, um, but this actually completes that overhaul. What's the total cost? Uh, I'd have to look that up. Well, when you say third phase, so it's it's more than this number. Oh yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Are there other schools that are comparable to this level of investment? Yes, and this is quite typical for an HVAC. Overall, this would be actually about a third of what most of our HVAC projects cost at a large school mm -hmm. or large building. Okay. HVAC costs are very expensive. Yeah. Fans are less expensive. Mm -hmm. The next contract is, is a request to the board to increase the contract with Chilmar by $900,000 to complete the HVAC system at Mergenthaler. I do have a question about, um, just for the record, I'm no longer a Hopkins employee, the Hopkins and Morgan and Burke grant or funding. I don't, if Allison were here, I would ask her, this is probably something that's of interest to the board, CTE, um, and I wonder if there could be a role for the board, at least some opportunity for the board or board members that are interested in this to have an opportunity to talk to the consultants. Thanks. The next contract is is a lease agreement uh, to provide the Baltimore Teacher Network with the ability to operate their charter school, Independence Charter School, at 1250 West 36th Street in Baltimore. Is that a vacant building? I can include it in the next write-up. Okay. Hello. Hi. I'm Nicole Stewart. Um, so, no, that's not a vacant building. So, this is just the lease. Uh, so, they are co-located with oh, um, Robert, Poole. Robert Poole in the new 21st century building. So, this is just the lease for the new building. So, just in terms of the procedure, <coughs> we're receiving money as a lease. How does this relate to procurement? Is this considered a procurement 
Correct. Uh, all lease agreements uh, go through my office to be presented to the board for their review. And and is there then a contract behind this, that yes, a sir, lease agreement? Be, yeah, the, the contract is handled by um, facilities. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next contract is with Denver ELEC. Uh, the purpose of this contract is to provide HVAC and fire replacement services at Samuel Coolidge Taylor Elementary Middle. The contract amount is nine million five hundred seventy-seven thousand five hundred dollars. It says Denver Alec. Are they from Denver, or just no. happens to be the name? It's just their company name. So they're a local entity. They're a local. Uh, the next contract is a request to the board to piggyback the state of Maryland contract with Morton to provide uh, de-icing salt. Do you want me to stop? I was trying to stop the IT people from leaving. Okay, that's okay. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the state of Maryland contract is October 1, 2018 through September 30th, 2020. 21 with two one-year renewal options. The estimated annual amount is $75,000. The next contract is a request to increase the existing contract with ESRI by $6,000. Uh, the, in the increase is necessary to, uh, to purchase the renewal licenses for the software uh, we use to support mapping and spatial analysis programs used by the district. That was just a general question. Um, at what point do you have to get the board approval over X amount? Is it twenty five thousand? In two instances, one when anything goes over twenty five thousand uh -huh. dollars, and two if any change order is over twenty five thousand oh, dollars. Okay. okay, thank you. The next contract is with Public Impact to provide the Opportunity Culture and Culture Initiative. Um, the cost of the contract is $735,000 and its purpose is to support implementation of the blueprint for success. Uh, the contract term is January 23rd, 19 through June 30th, 2021. And lastly, Request the board's approval to increase and amend an existing contract with James Wadham to provide legal services as it relates to negotiations. Uh, the increase amount is $66,400 uh, and to extend the term through June 30th, 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hey, I, when I guess one question. I mean, okay. I'm the new neophyte on the board. Uh, ergo, I guess, in terms of my questions, it's you start out with the contract. Mm -hmm. And the contract says it may go one to, th to three years. Then you have an annual cost. Mm -hmm. Then sometimes you may have an increase because of some extraordinary item. Mm -hmm. When you put in your, your request, it's a lot easier for me to see it delineated for all three years in terms of the annual costs okay. and in terms of the total costs because chances are you come back next year and say, hey, I need this, this same amount of money or I need more money because, I mean, I'm looking at this, it's like, I guess, for, for instance, when we look at just Halos and Betty, Betty Ford Foundation, you have an annual cost, you have a total cost, and it's it's kind of confusing sometimes. So do see. See, like, see, that's that's fifty four thousand for twenty schools. Right. The annual cost is one million eight. Then you're going to have that for three years. So the aggregate cost is going to be about three point four right. million dollars. So Correct. I mean, so the point is. Mm -hmm. I need to know the aggregate too. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, 
I want to thank the IT department for coming back. I had a question, and um, it was related to um, our public meeting uh, that we had um, that was open to the public, and uh, our um, councilwoman, vice president of city council, Sharon Middleton, asked a question that was of great concern to her, and um, it was in reference to uh, Martin Luther King School, and they had, and I think they delivered the computers in September, and one of your, our staff went out there to do some work, and the parts that were supposed to be connected, uh, someone was supposed to come back and, and finish the project, and they had not been back. I understand they, they came back in January. I just need to know where that fell through. Um, was it that, let me finish, and was it that the principal was supposed to contact um, our staff? Or what happened? Sure. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I'll give you an update. Um, so, September 2018, the uh, MLK was, you know, was donated about 100 desktops. Um, so we were made aware of that. Meaning, the IT department was made aware of that. We went to the school. We did an assessment, and we basically identified the additional equipment which is needed to hook up the computers whether it is VGA cards or mice and all that stuff. And we give that to the principal so that she can order that. And we were told she ordered it. And we, in fact, informed the principal once the order is shipped, she can reopen the ticket so we can, the technician can come back and finish up the setting up the computers, right? So she put in an order, the principal put in an order. We were told uh, they got the order sometime in end of December, just before the break. A new ticket was put in Jan 3rd. In fact, the technician was there on Jan 3rd when the ticket was open, right? He set up the lab already. About 30 computers were set up. Uh, we have set up an additional 35 computers in other classrooms which the principals have identified. So we have probably about 20 or 30 computers left. We are still working with that school. So hopefully this week we will be done setting up the remaining computers. So that's the history behind that. So September again, um, we I mean, please, September and uh, I would say December, because uh, we told the school what additional parts which needs to be ordered. So the print in September. in September, and we have a ticket for that, and we have documented uh, what the ticket said and everything. Everything was documented, and we told the principal to basically reopen the ticket, right, or put a new ticket once the equipment arrives, meaning the mice and the carts and everything, right? And she did, um, that she put in a new ticket, Jan 3rd. In fact, on Jan 3rd, uh, we... Well, she put in a ticket because she ordered the equipment and she was waiting for the equipment to be shipped. My understanding was that the equipment came in September. No. The, okay. the computers were donated. So the, the two actual computers were in September. Yes. But the equipment to connect the computers Correct. did Correct. not come until. That is right. That is right. Until when December the, end. Until December. Right. Okay. And the new ticket was put in after the break, which was Jan 3rd. And Jan 3rd, uh, our technician was already there mm -hmm. setting up the uh, lab and everything. And he finished that uh, mm -hmm. setting up the lab. And... Uh, and he's working with the principal to say, okay, you got remaining 30 or 40 desktop uh, left. Where do you want me to set up? So that he's working with the principal to set okay. those things up. You know, that's, um, this is an interesting example of the conversation that we had before in reference to documenting com computer on the computer when the, a ticket is put through from the principal to order something. Yep. And the, the ticket is um, documented all the way through so everybody will know right. by going into the system what's going on. This is a perfect example right. of why how critical that is. And we talked about that um, earlier, about eight or nine months ago. I'm not sure how many months ago. But we had that conversation about how critical it is for everybody to document the requests when things arrive so we won't ever have to go through that again. And that eliminates any of this. Right. And just you know. to piggyback off that, um, Commissioner, we, in fact, uh, reached out to Councilwoman Middleton regarding that, uh, because I know she raised that in the public forum. We reached out. We, 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 we called her office. We couldn't get hold of her. But we have uh, sent an email basically articulating what, what happened. And we, in fact, also reached out to the principal 
In fact, right now, our technicians are in the school setting up the remaining 20 or 30 desktops left out. So we are providing all the support which is needed to make sure there is no uh, drop in the support. This is a perfect example of what we were talking about before when, when council people or legislators ask us questions and we're like, okay, we, you know, just getting this information so we can have the correct answers and we just, just, we aren't just winging it. You know, we can give good information, but thank you very much. Thank you everybody. I'd like to thank everybody for participating and our next uh, operation meeting will be February the 19th in this room at 10 to 1130. Thank you very much.